Hi everyone, thank you for being here for week nine of our course, Poetics of Anticolonial Joy. Um, today is our first lecture of our third module, and in this module we're going to explore themes related to rest and refusal as um, anti-colonial strategies of resistance. Now, as I mentioned last week, and as I've been kind of foreshadowing for, I guess, a good while at this point, for several weeks at this point, today we're finally engaging with the work of one of my very, very favorite poets and thinkers, um, that I deeply admire, and that has been a great influence in my own work and, and way of thinking, really, which is Edouard Lissin. It is from his work that the title for today's lecture comes from, uh, which is We Demand the Right for, to Opacity. And today we're also reading a text by another thinker I really admire, political activist, and culture and media theorist Nelly Pinkra, who is currently working on her PhD on Glissant and cybernetics. Now, if you're interested in the intersections of decolonial thinking, technology, media, and art, I super, super recommend that you read a little bit more of Nelly's work and um, look for a little bit more of what she's been doing. Now, having said that, having kind of done that little introduction, I am aware that some of you might be a bit baffled by Glissant's writing. If you've taken a look at the rest of the book, which is in our, um, in our course materials, you might have noticed that he writes in a very particular way, right? Um, the way that he writes is quite, um, let's say, convoluted. And sometimes it seems, at the same time, so abstract and yet weirdly specific. And it is a form of writing that, to me, or that I see holds uh, such a deep loyalty to itself and its own form. Although, if you look, you can also see that it maintains kind of a dialogic relationship with other forms of writing philosophy, to an extent, at least. Glissant's discussions on key topics in his writing can often seem kind of like lateral or tangential or <laughs> diagonal, I'd say. Like he's never really giving you the answer that you expect or a direct explanation or a definition of what he means. As if instead of saying yes or no simply, um, he communicates in, in really, in, in, as I said, in tangents, opening up all these kind of undefined spaces and spaces of uncertainty. Now, of course, um, talking about opacity, Glissant has plenty of reasons to approach his writing in, in this way. He practices his own right to opacity while writing about opacity. And I know I already mentioned this before, but I'm going to bring this back because I think it's, it's, an important, um, it's something important to keep in mind. So theory in these fields, in fields like um, cultural studies, feminist studies, queer studies, philosophy, sociology, and so on and so forth, theory in, this, in these fields is an attempt to unravel and expand and make sense um, of whole sets of complex issues and questions. It might feel often overwhelming and, and confusing, really, to try to read certain authors, but like Lisan, I, I realize, but 
but don't despair, really. Um, nobody really gets it at first pass, and that's perfectly okay. One thing that works for me, and it's something that I try to implement, particularly when reading certain authors like Lisson, um, is that I I kind of let the the text kind of wash over me. I go through the whole thing first, um, without really worrying too much about you know specific details or things that I didn't understand immediately or that I, I didn't completely uh, process. Um, I do take notes and I write the like whatever comments come to mind, whatever kind of connections or references might come to mind. Um, I also mark and make marks on, or notes on things that I didn't really get and that I want to go back to afterwards, um, the things that I want to think more about, um, the comments or opinions I might have on a particular point. And after that, I just give it a bit of time, go do something else, take a walk, I don't know, eat something, have a coffee, um, and really let it settle. Let that theory um, settle in your mind and let that those thoughts, um, give it some time, give, be patient. And after that, after a while, after I feel, you know, that... that um, I'm at a point where, you know, my brain has rested a little bit. Um, then I go back and look at what wasn't clear at first and so on. So, of course, um, what I just described here is what works for me specifically. Uh, and that relates to my own process. Um, maybe you can find another way of or another strategy that feels more comfortable for you. Um, that's obviously just a, a suggestion. Um, but what I want to convey here is that there's no need to feel um, the pressure to understand everything at once. And and I think this is this is a really, really important idea for today specifically. I mean we're we're gonna discuss this um, further on in this lecture, but keep that in mind. Don't feel the, the pressure to get everything at once. Theory is a process, and a process takes time. But, of course, you know, um, I'm also mentioning this because within Western uh, education, um, educational institutions, Western uh, modes of education, we're also taught to seek transparency, right? So a text like Lisan, a text that asserts its own opacity so so joyfully and that embraces opacity in this way, might feel a little jarring at first. Um, it is a text that really rejoices in, in the uncertainty and the interstices and the, the, the crevices that we're taught to fear. Now, having said that, for all the anxiety that it causes, however, uncertainty, and I think this is really important to keep in mind, uncertainty is also possibility. What lies beyond the, the supposedly absolute truths of yes and no? What happens when a writer like Lisan refuses to give you a straight answer? What can exist in these crevices, in these in-between spaces, um, the spaces of that which we cannot simply measure with our own parameters or the parameters we were given and taught to value? What lies in the corners of our vision, the shifting shadows um, of ghosts and, and spirits at the edge of perception? So I think this requires us to also examine our own impulses, that which we were taught to seek and to desire and to strive for in our thinking, in our education, in, 
in general, in our way of engaging with the world. Now, here immediately we enter a conversation on language and form, right? Which is, of course, one of the first discussions that, um, that Glissant offers in the book, in The Poetics of Relation. Um, and that is also something that is picked up in the introduction written by the translator, Betsy Wink, which, if you're going to read the whole book, I super recommend also that you read her introduction, because um, since Glissant was a poet and he wrote in French originally, the book was originally written in French, um, that was his um, his main language um, for writing. Um, there are some specific specificities to um, to the translation, the choices that Betsy Wing made while translating this um, this work. So yeah, if you're if you're going to read the whole book, I super recommend that you take a look at that too. Um, so, as I mentioned, Glissant was a poet, right? So, as a poet, he had a knack for kind of zeroing on the particularity of words and their etymology, their history, uh, the processes that really led us towards expressing something in a particular way. And one thing that to me stands out in in the way that he engages with text, in the way that he expresses um, these thoughts, these ideas, is his discussion of the term grasping in the chapter that we read, for instance. Glissant about the, the idea of grasping, he writes, the opaque is not the obscure though it is possible for it to be so and be accepted as such. It is that which cannot be reduced, which is the most perennial guarantee of participation and confluence. We are far from the opacities of myth or tragedy, whose obscurity was accompanied by exclusion and whose transparency aimed at grasping. In this version of understanding the verb to grasp contains the movement of hands that grab their surroundings and bring them back to themselves. A gesture of enclosure, if not appropriation. Let our understanding prefer the gesture of giving on and with that opens finally on totality. When I first read this passage years ago, it gave me pause, to be honest. So here, language, what I, what I find interesting, I wanna, what I really want to, to bring up today is that, so here he's acknowledging language as, um, and approaching it in its, let's say, I would say it's full materiality. All that which comes before and after the word, the multitudes it, it carries. The symbolic act of grasping a concept then starts to exist in relation to the act of enclosure, right? The, the grasping of the hand. And I, I would also say um, individuation, a claiming of... Uh, of, of a part of the whole. And this leads me to think of grasping in so many different aspects, this enclosure, this act of enclosing um, in so many different aspects, grasping as land grabbing, an act of enclosure, a, privati a, a privatization of space that asserts a perceived right to settle and to do whatever the settler sees fit with, with the land, with the soil, with the earth, with that which should belong to none and to all. Also, the violent act of harassment, the grasping of body parts that seeks to reduce 
the one who is being grasped into something less than human, a way of making another readable within the, the constraints and the parameters of hetero white supremacist patriarchy. An object that can be manipulated in whatever way the aggressor, the harasser, the grasper sees fit. A colonial desire and a capitalist fantasy of invasion and consummation. And indeed, earlier in the book, when introducing the concept of grasping, Lisson writes, Since the beginning of this century, the shrinking of unexplored regions on the map of the world has made minds less infatuated with adventure or less sensitive to its beauty, inclining more towards a concern for the truth of human beings. Understanding cultures, then, became more gratifying than discovering new lands. Western ethnography was structured on the basis of this need. But we shall perhaps see that the verb to understand in the sense of to grasp has a fearsome repressive meaning here. So here we see, especially, you know, thinking about ethnology and thinking about all the, the, um, the categories of the human that, um, that ethnology and let's say it's related disciplines seek uh, to, to establish. So here we see then grasping as categorization, right? Implicated in the, the foundational act of coloniality, which is this, as I said, the, the establishment of hierarchical racial categories that determine who is granted access to the realm of humanity and who is not. A gesture that seeks to determine the hows and the whats of the existence of entire, entire peoples on earth from the removed, supposedly removed vantage point of the European gaze. And indeed, this is something that also appears in um, the article that we read from Nelly Pinkra. Um, in her writing, she picks up on, on these threads discussing the relation between um, the, the work of Lisa and the digital. She writes, the cultural logic of the binary that is enforced and materialized through the digital increasingly becomes contested ground, a site to be broken up. For decades, this theoretical work has been done by the so-called disciplines of minorities. Feminist theory, postmodernism, and poststructuralism. They have questioned the enlightenment way of constructing everything as binary oppositions. Nature, culture, human, machine, black, white, master, slave, which she points out here. The latter terminology is used in informatics and software engineering, by the way, and more. So then um, analyzing the, the binaries, like the binaries um, established through these, um, through these, uh, let's say, um, epistemological traditions, um, that of course you know also determine as um, as I mentioned who is um, who is us and who are the others you know um, so discussing modes of divesting from these binary constructs, Pinkra mentions the work of the literary and artistic collective Black Quantum Futurism, which she points out merges quantum mechanical interpretations of specific concepts like space-time with Afrocentric knowledge and understandings of it to argue against their Western counterparts. 
here I want to take a moment to endorse the recommendation of um, Black Pontifaturism and the work as a collective, as well as the um, individual work of Rashida Phillips, who is an uh, who is a, a family member of um, the collective and an amazing, amazing writer and artist, and also Kame Ayewa, who is uh, also a member of Black Bunch of Futurism and an amazing poet and musician operating under the alias of More Mother, and is also a member of the band Irreversible Entanglements. So, having said that, as a collective, um, Black Quantum Futurism offers some super, super interesting perspectives on time as making, um, which are very much born from a refusal to allow white supremacist power structure to erase Black futurities. Now, thinking about this and... and um, and these binaries and this construction of, of um, the categories of, of um, one and the other uh, and, and these refusals also. This takes me back to the work of filmmaker and theorist Trin Min Ha, which I mentioned a few weeks ago. I don't know if you remember. Uh, Min Ha, as, my, as uh, maybe you recall, developed the concept of speaking nearby. And this is what I mentioned a few weeks ago. She developed this concept as kind of a, a guiding principle to her film practice. It's an idea that is very, very present in her film Reassemblage, which is a, a consideration of the ethnographic film genre that seeks ultimately to present a grasping gaze over its subjects, right? And here there's, I think there's quite an interesting connection, you know, in, in bringing this up and, and thinking about what, um, what Glissan mentions about um, ethnography, about the, the, the origins of ethnography as a field of knowledge. So, um, as I said, um, this film is a critical reflection on the practice of documentary and ethnograph ethnographic filmmaking. Um, and in the short film, uh, the short film depicts scenes of daily life in rural Senegal. But the thing is that instead of using the voiceover as kind of an explanatory device, Trimming has narration refuses to describe going. And instead, what she does is that she focus, she focuses on uh, reflections about her own role as someone who has no cultural relation to the populations being depicted. And with that, Minha claims a wish not to speak about just speak nearby. This is what she says in, in the film, which is um, an acknowledgement of her presence, right? Of her gaze towards another reality, which she is refusing to, to even attempt to explain and to interpret. And uh, in, her, in her own words, and here I'm gonna uh, go for a quote, a quote that I already um, had in one of the, the, the classes in the previous weeks, I don't remember exactly when, but I think it's useful for us to go back to the quote. She says that speaking nearby is a speaking that does not objectify, does not point to an object as if it is distant from the speaking subject or absent from the speaking place. A speaking that reflects on itself and can come very close to a subject without, however, seizing or claiming it. And here, interrupting the quote, I would say, grasping it. A speaking in brief, whose closures are only moments of transition, opening up to other possible moments of transition. 
These are forms of indirectness, well understood by anyone in tune with poetic language. Every element constructed in a film refers to the world around it, while having at the same time a life of its own. And this life is precisely what is lacking when one uses word, image, or sound just as an instrument of thought. To say, therefore, that one prefers not to speak about, but rather to speak nearby, is a great challenge. Because actually, this is not just a technique or a statement to be made verbally. It is an attitude in life, a way of positioning oneself in relation to the world. Thus, the challenge is to materialize it in all aspects of the film, verbally, musically, visually. That challenge is renewed, I realize, whether filmic or written. Now, what is key here in Minha's understanding of speaking nearby, and that to me resonates in Glissant's thinking, is precisely the idea that that we can be multiple, one and the other at once, same and different. And this is, of course, a profoundly political act embedded, that is also embedded, and I think this, this is uh, important to remember, embedded in every aspect of life. In many ways, the idea of speaking nearby reconnects um, with the... I would say with the philosophical concept of diffraction as discussed by Donna Haraway and by physicist and philosopher Karen Barad too. And um, diffraction is quite a, a, a dense subject, but I'm going to bring it up um, briefly here because I'm I think it's um, it's perhaps useful to to kind of at least touch a little bit upon it. But we can elaborate this further in case you're interested um, further on in the course. So Haraway um, argues for diffraction in place of reflection, right, as a strategy with which to analyze worldly phenomena. So instead of reflecting on something, she, sa she um, suggests that we diffract. What she says is that diffraction does not produce the same displaced as reflection would. Going back to the quote, diffraction is a mapping of interference, not of replication, reflection, or reproduction. A diffraction pattern does not map where differences appear, but rather maps where the effects of difference appear. Adding to Haraway's reflections, Karen Barad clarifies that, and this is a quote, a diffractive methodology is a critical practice for making a difference in the world. It is a commitment to understanding which differences matter, how they matter, and for whom. What is interesting to me is that, um, you know, when you think about the Tahiri quote, what she says about replication, reflection, reproduction. So repetitions can indicate assumptions, right, which are informed by colonial impositions of economic, political, epistemological, uh, and cultural systems. These repetitions... Um, Tend to um, tend to expose what is perceived as so-called neutral, global, or universal uh, about the world. Um, manifestations of this impulse for unity and transparency, as discussed by by Glissant, and conversely, these diffractive lenses then offer us a way to see the world that embraces that which is, is opaque, even within ourselves. 
Now, in Glissant's writing, in the way that um, in in his book, um, diffraction is physically manifested in the scattered islands of the Caribbean and deeply embedded in the concept of errantry, which we have discussed here a few times already, and in the concept of creolization, which he proposes as an expansion, uh, in a way, of the idea of mestizaje, which we have also mentioned when we were discussing the work of, of Gloria Saldúa. Creolization is relation in that Creolization diffracts. Um, it's, it is always open and never fixed, always shifting. You see that instead of using the word specifically, instead of using the word um, creolité, which is a, a concept that has been developed by, um, by Caribbean writers and thinkers, he talks about creolization as a verb. So clamoring for thinking about um, this concept of realization, which you know, we, we'll, we'll um, um, unravel this a little bit um, more in a second, but um, what Glissant warns us is that clamoring for opacity does not imply some kind of nostalgic yearning for a state um, supposedly untouched by the forces of, of, of colonization either, which is a warning that is also echoed in the work of Gloria Saldúa. In an interview with filmmaker, cultural theorist, and writer Mantia Diawara, Glissant points out, For a long time now, I have developed the idea of creolization which is a permanent process that supersedes historical avatars. It's difficult to admit this because we're afraid of losing ourselves. We tell ourselves, if I change, then I'll lose myself. If I take something from the other, then my own self will disappear. We absolutely must abandon this error. He goes on to say, in this very moment, and I, this is to me is so relevant right now, in this very moment, the world is creolizing itself. And there are no longer nations or races that are untouched by others. And what racists fear the most of all is mixing. They don't allow for it. And that, I think, is the battle we need to wage, despite everything happening in the world, all those fundamentalisms of all shapes and sizes. I believe we are on the way to winning that battle. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so, Glissant. And here, um, as I mentioned once again, I will trace a parallel with the work of Lorenz Saldúa, specifically with her discussion of Nepantla, which we also have already gone through a few weeks back, right? And this is something I love. You see how things are starting to kind of come together, how all these different theorizations and articulations offer such a rich landscape um, from which we can relate to the world. This is incredible to me. This is so exciting to me to explore all these points of connections and divergences and, and diffractions um, between all of these authors and all these thinkers and, and, um, and the framings that we're engaging with throughout the semester. But anyway, um, going back, Anzaldúa writes that in Nepantla, and this is a quote, Two or more forces clash and are held teetering on the verge of chaos, a state of entreguerras. Remember what Glissant says? A battle, a spiritual battle, he elaborates further on in, in that same interview. But, yes, sorry. Um, two or more forces clash and are held teetering on the verge of chaos, a state of entreguerras. 
these tensions between extremes create cracks or tears in the membrane surrounding, protecting, and containing the different cultures and their perspectives. Nepantla is the place where at once we are detached, separated, and attached, connected to each of our several cultures. Here, the watcher on the bridge can see through, um, oh, sorry, here the watcher on the bridge, Nepantla, can see through the larger symbolic process that's trying to become conscious through a particular life situation or event. Nepantla is the midway point between the conscious and the unconscious, the place where transformations are enacted. Nepantla is a place where we can accept contradiction and paradox. Accepting contradiction and paradox, this, this is truly a difficult task. When we are embedded within this context where we fear these things, remember what I was mentioning in right in the beginning of this lecture, right? Um, where when we're taught that grasping, consuming is the ultimate goal, also the ultimate goal not only of going through life, but um, even in the context of, of education. So Glissant's discussion of the act of grasping to me, when he first encountered it, raised more questions than offered answers, to be honest. And this, you know, when I read the book years ago, and actually it still does today, these are questions without a definitive ending that open up and close down and open up again. What do we enclose with our bodies? What do we grasp as we travel between worlds? And, and here I'm, I'm referencing the concept of worlds um, offered my, by Maria Logones, which we discussed already several times in class, right? Or who is allowed to perform these acts of grasping? How and under which circumstances? How is that grasping articulated through, with, and across difference? And both as a way to, to assert it and as a way to maintain a notion of unity aimed at understanding the human experience within this kind of homogenous framework of analysis. And indeed, worlds demand that we grasp or be grasped. And, or, or be grasped. And, and what worlds allow us to experience what Glissant suggests as this form of giving on and with, which, um, Betsy Wing, which is Betsy Wing's translation from the original French Donné avec. I see here a deep and beautiful connection between what Glissant is talking about and once again the concept of playfulness um, and world travel offered by Lugones. Looking at these concepts again, and here I'm, I'm going to repeat a little bit. I think, you know, I know maybe it is a little bit tiring, but I do think it's important to kind of bring those things back to, to our discussion. So Lugones understands worlds as kind of these provisional articulations that emerge around subjects that are in relation. Not necessarily Glissant's relation, Gliss or um, a Glissant's understanding of relation, but that exist within kind of the same um, space, the uh, physical space or symbolic space. Now, these worlds don't need to represent or reflect society at large, as we have discussed. And instead, they are localized and situated and specific. They might shift even for the same subject uh, as she transforms and travels through different spaces, beings, environments. It is the act of passing between these different worlds, these different articulations that Lugones calls travel. And there is also, I would say, a, a foundational generosity in the idea of giving on and with, 
in embracing opacity and in playfulness. Generosity as a form of love, a way of being with another, whilst also acknowledging the impossibility of completely knowing one another. To me, one of the most beautiful forms of love. Love divested from the impulse of grasping, of owning, of consuming. It is also the impulse, you know, thinking about this and thinking about how um, there is this, um, thinking about this intertwining or this intersection between generosity and love. On the other hand, there is also, um, we must also think about the impulse to own and to consume, to make transparent and readable and therefore exploitable that Glissant identifies as part of the colonial project in one, ch one passage in this chapter. He writes, Merely consider the hypothesis of a Christian Europe, convinced of its legitimacy, rallied together in its reconstituted universality, having once again, therefore, transformed its forces into a universal value triangulated with the technological strength of the United States and the financial sovereignty of Japan, and you will have some notion of the silence and indifference that for the next 50 years, if it is possible thus to estimate, surround the problems, the dependence, and the chaotic sufferings of the countries of the South with nothingness. Rereading this chapter for today's class, this passage strikes me as incredibly prescient in, in some aspects. I mean, the, this Christian Europe that he mentions, so convinced of its legi legitimacy, um, which, you know, I would, I would expand um, as white Christianity rather than um, strictly Christian Europe, right? Um, this uh, white Christianity has a direct link to the ways in which white supremacists, you know, are, are, are showing themselves right now. Um, from the refusal to wear a mask in public spaces to the occupation of legislative, uh, legislative seats by the AfD in Germany to the invasion of the Capitol in Washington last week and its documentation with, with phones for social media um, or the shameless calls for COVID vaccine trials in uh, African nations that we saw a few months back. And pointedly in the interview with Monte Diawara, Glissant says, there's a basic injustice and in the worldwide spread of the transparency and projection of Western thoughts. Why must we value, why must we evaluate people on the scale of transparency of the ideas proposed by the West? I understand this and understand that and the other rationality. I said that as far as I'm concerned, a person has the right to be opaque. That doesn't stop me from liking that person. It doesn't stop me from working with him, hanging out with him and so on. A racist is someone who refuses what he doesn't understand. I can accept what I don't understand. Opacity is a right we must have. I accept my opacity on that level. Why wouldn't I accept it on other levels? Why wouldn't I? I accept the others why wouldn't I accept the other's opacity? Why must I absolutely understand the other in order to live next to him and work with him? That's one of the laws of relation. In relation, elements don't blend just like that, don't lose themselves just like that. Each element can keep its, I won't just say its autonomy, but also its essential quality, even as it accustoms itself to the essential qualities and differences of others. And then 
he says something that honestly stayed with me from the first time that I read this piece, this interview. One of the one of those passages that you carry you carry with you through life. He says, or he goes, um, I say that nothing is true and everything is alive. We've already gone over this. What that means is that nothing is absolutely true. There isn't one absolute truth, but truths. Everything is alive. Everything is a relation of differences, not contraries, but differences. Now we're here 45 minutes and to end the lecture today, I would like to read you, um, I mean, although this uh, glissant quote could very much end the lecture, I also wanted to read you a beautiful poem written by queer artist, performer, and writer Mark Aguhar. To me, in this piece, she speaks so beautifully to the impossibility of truth and the powerful solidarity that can stem from acknowledging and making space for those craters amongst ourselves. The dark corners where our opacities or ghosts lie. The poem is titled Litanies to my Heavenly Brown Body. Blessed are the sissies, blessed are the boy dykes, blessed are the people of color, my beloved kith and kin. Blessed are the trans, blessed are the high femmes, blessed are the sex workers, blessed are the authentic, blessed are the disidentifiers, blessed are the gender illusionists, blessed are the non-normative, blessed are the gender queers, blessed are the kingsters, blessed are the disabled, blessed are the hot fat girls, blessed are the weirdo queers, blessed is the spectrum, blessed is consent, blessed is respect, blessed are the beloved who I didn't describe, couldn't describe, will learn to describe and respect and love. Amen. With that, we finish today's lecture. Thank you so much for watching and I'm looking forward to class. Thank you.